Dr. Gürhüks, I would like to start with welcoming you to Turkey. Uh, as far as I know, this is the first time in Turkey. First of all, do you have a chance to visit Istanbul, around Istanbul? Uh, just to the Topkapi Palace and the Blue Mosque and Hajj Sophia. It's a very nice city, a very pleasant city. Thank you very much. Also, on behalf of the organi organization committee of the sixth National Food Safety Congress, I would like to thank for arriving here and sharing your knowledge with the participants of the Congress. And I listened to your speech in the morning, but I would like to ask some questions that for the people who cannot listen, have a chance to listen to your speech. As far as we know, bacteria can talk to each other, as you said in your speech, through the molecules that they produce. Many bacteria come together in one particular place, uh, what's enough to form a quorum so that the number of members have to vote for a certain issue in a procedure like parliamentary procedure. Then they will communicate with each other through chemical messages. This phenomenon is called quorum sensing. So could we briefly define it as to south to communication in bacteria? And could you please inform us what exactly quorum sensing is and what is the purpose of it? Well, <clears throat> there are different levels of, uh, of quorum sensing. There's an um, intra-species quorum sensing where bacteria that are similar talk to each other. Then there's a universal system which uses um, a molecule called autoinducer 2 and that allows communication between uh, different genera, so gram negatives and gram positives and a whole bunch of organisms can talk to each other. And then the third level is um, where bacteria talk to the, to the host, to the human body or the animal body. So the quorum sensing controls a number of uh, physiological events. It controls uh, virulence, it controls biofilm formation. Uh, in certain organisms, it controls sporulation and germination. So, it it is really uh, underlies uh, uh, the the physiology of, of bacterial cells. Um, why do they do it? Well, pathogenic bacteria do it primarily to avoid the host defenses. So. If they can start triggering harmful events when there's a large number of cells present, they have uh, a greater chance of overcoming the, uh, the host immune system. So basically it's, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism in a, in a large uh, number of cases. So it, it, it can be used to overcome uh, adverse environmental conditions or it can be used to overcome host defenses. It affects the many uh, circuits to regulate a diverse array of physiological activities, for example symbiosis as you said, virulence, competence, conjugation, antibiotic production as well as prolation and biofilm formation. And how is it controlled? By the genes? of the bacteria, why do bacteria prefer to talk to each other? Is there a benefit for themselves? Yeah, well, the, the, the benefit is that they only trigger responses when it's, uh, when it's required. So they, they don't waste a lot of energy doing things that they don't need to, uh, to do. So that, that's one of the main reasons for, uh, for quorum sensing. Um, now as you say, the, there's a large number of, of, of events and it's you know, the, the, the molecules that are produced when they re-enter the cells, they, they trigger transcription of a whole number of, uh, of, different, uh, of different genes. So these are genes that are involved in, as you say, you know, biofilm formation, uh, virulence determinants, sporulation, a whole bunch of things. From the point of view of uh, foodborne diseases, especially foodborne poisoning, 
uh, how is core sensing is so important? Uh, again, it's, it, it involves the transcription of genes that are required for, uh, for pathogenicity, for virulence. So, and this is done only when the, the bacteria are at a level that they can overcome the host defenses. So, again, it's a way of, of conserving energy, of only producing molecules when they have a, a, a good chance of, of surviving and a good chance of, uh, of creating the effect that they're meant to. And, uh, does the food environment play a role in initiating or inhibiting quorum sensing responses in bacteria? Well, there have been shown, it has been shown that food can t can t contain uh, auto induce and mimics so that they, they can have the same effect as some of the, uh, the, the, the pheromones that are used for quorum sensing. Um, there are also bacteria present in, in foods that can, uh, that can disrupt quorum sensing signals in a variety of ways. Uh, a lot of bacillus, for instance, will produce an enzyme that will uh, inactivate the uh, autoinducer one, the ASR homoserine lactones. So, yeah, food can, uh, can have a, a, a big part in, uh, in, in quorum sensing through, uh, through stimulating growth of certain organisms or by, uh, by producing mimics of, uh, of autoinducer molecules. So presumably, this process bestows upon bacteria some of the qualities of higher organisms. Uh, so do you also think that the evaluation of quorum sensing systems in bacteria could have been one of the early steps in the development of multicellularity? Well, yeah, again, you know, this business about communities and biofilm formation and the, the communication of cells within biofilms, so that helps. Uh, maintain populations, maintain communities of, of bacterial cells. Um, and as I said in my talk, there's now also evidence that, uh, that viruses can, uh, can communicate with, with their hosts. So it, it seems to be a, you know, a, a, a common thread throughout the, uh, throughout the living world that, that cells communicate with each other. And other than quorum sensing, lots of rapid microbiological analysis techniques are developed and still developing. Uh, do you think that they will, they have more advantages and they will replace truly the golden standard cultural techniques in the future? Because we still need to compare the uh, results and to compare the methods efficiency, sensitivity and selectivity uh, of the new methods with the golden standards like cultural techniques, do you think they will replace and we will forget the cultural techniques in the future in microbial analyses? Well, in a lot of situations we can't use cultural techniques because the organisms don't want uh, grow under the conditions that, that, that we use. So um, I mentioned you know, the, the gut microbiome and that a lot of the work on the, the gut microbiome is mainly centered on, uh, you know, on uh, whole genome sequencing and uh, the, the genetic makeup of the, uh, of, of the population in the gut, not the ability to, to culture organisms. Um, but you no, know, when we come to epidemiology, I think that there's still a requirement for an isolate, for a, a, a single source of the uh, of the organism. So it, it depends on the situation. You know, in some situations you'll you'll need to, uh, you'll need to culture the organism. In other situations, uh, the, there is no need to, to culture the organism. You came uh, here uh, by traveling for a, for a far distance. I don't want to make you tired. That's why I will ask you the last question. 
uh, what is the most risky uh, situation that threatens food safety? In your opinion, the pesticides, the residues, the microorganisms, uh, the human beings. <laughs> <coughs> well, again, um, in in the short term, obviously, uh, microorganisms. Um, you know, and the, the the causes of foodborne illness have uh, have evolved over the the past several decades. So now. Certainly in North America, the, the main cause of, of foodborne illness is, uh, uh, is fruit, uh, our fruits and vegetables. Um, and also, the, the most number of cases of foodborne illness are caused by viruses, not, not bacteria. Although still, the, the deaths caused by bacteria outweigh deaths caused by viruses. But you know, we, we, we're seeing a, a a transformation to foods that that are difficult to to decontaminate, if you if you like, and to uh, to organisms that you know we, we can't necessarily culture. Um, no, the norovirus we can't culture norovirus. Um, so there's certainly an evolution of of, of food safety, and it continues to to evolve. As regards chemicals, um, yeah, you no. Know, in the in the long term, there, there may be uh, adverse consequences. But uh, I, again, you no. Know, the the regulations around pesticide use, insecticide use, are, are are getting tighter and tighter. So I think some of those issues will uh, will, will reduce with time. Dr. Griffiths, 15 years ago, you gave me a chance, great chance, to work in your lab with your group. Uh, I still remember those days with good memories. Uh, I still keep in touch with the friends that uh, worked at that time at Creeps. Uh, and it's a very great opportunity for me to see you in my country this time, 15 years later, where the continents meet. Uh, I hope in the future we will see you in Turkey or somewhere in the world. Uh, you are a great teacher. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure having you in my lab. And I'm glad to hear that you still keep in touch with, uh, with the people that you work with. Thank you.